The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M O O N F L E E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, 
so you have to leave your car somewhere else and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's OK, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students talking about a school project. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Lynn. How's your project coming along? Oh, not very well. I've got all the information, but I can't seem to organise it into a presentation. Well, you'd better hurry. You only have one more week. Yes, that's OK. It's just that... Oh. Well, why don't you try your presentation on me? Maybe I can help. Oh, really? Great! OK, well, I've chosen solar power for my subject and I'm going to talk specifically about domestic water heating. You know, like the ones popular in America. I've got some facts here. Oh, that's good. But just start your presentation from the beginning. Oh, right. Well, he here we go then. There are many reasons why we should be looking elsewhere for energy sources. As most people are aware, fossil fuels and other such non-renewable sources are by definition finite, so something needs to be in operation soon. Currently, there are a number of alternative energy sources available which can, with a little preparation, be used to provide for a significant part of our domestic energy requirements. In this presentation, I am focusing on solar power and its application as a domestic water heater. As a renewable energy source, solar power is in many ways ideal. The amount of the sun's energy which reaches the earth every minute exceeds the energy that the global population consumes in a year. Although scientists argue that it is not finite, sunlight is certainly a long-lasting resource which is not depleted through use, and solar power converters use this energy without needing any complex moving parts. Once collected and stored, solar energy can be used for many purposes, but it is becoming increasingly popular as a domestic heating source. Generally, a building that is heated by solar power will have its water heated by solar power as well, and this has even worked in areas that are not exposed to long hours of direct sunlight, such as the United Kingdom, although not so well as in warmer climates. Why have you stopped? Well, that's all I've got so far. Oh, well. Start by talking about how effective it is. Oh, OK. Well, there are a number of factors that influence how efficient solar power can be. The first, obviously, is the amount of sunlight, and this is dependent on season, time of day and climate. Although the UK has something of a bad reputation for sunshine, it is actually quite productive during some parts of the year. Given a sufficient size of solar panel and water storage tank, solar power can provide all of our water heating requirements in June and July and even provide the majority until October. From October to the end of the year, this figure falls dramatically. 
December is the least productive, being able to supply less than 5% of the average household's hot water requirement. It is at this point that solar power needs to be supplemented with a more traditional form of heating. From January, solar power becomes more effective at a rate of about 20% per month, although this rise decelerates to around 18% by May. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now say something about this water heater. Do you have any information about that? Oh yes, I've got an illustration of a water tank here. Well, that's good, but you'll have to describe it. Right. Well, the ideal water tank in the UK has a capacity of 45 to 50 litres, but must be at least 40 litres to be effective. The solar coil is put in the bottom of the tank to heat the water. Now remember that solar heated water will not get quite as hot as fossil fuel water heaters. The bottom half of the tank is normally 20 degrees, and this is why it is important not to have a tank that is too large, as that would take too much energy to heat. In this illustration, it rises to 40 degrees from halfway up. Don't forget that hot water rises, so the top third of the tank is the hottest and reaches an average temperature of 65 degrees. And what's the second layer around the tank? Oh, that's insulation. Because the tank is often either outside or just under the roof, rigid foam is used as an insulation layer. It should be at least 80 millimetres thick all around. Well, that seems like a good presentation. All you need to do is to prepare some short notes and a larger illustration so you can use it as a demonstration and you'll be fine. Oh, you think so? Well, thanks very much for the help. Maybe I could do the same for you one day. Maybe. Anyway, I have to go. Good luck. Thanks. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a moderator and two students. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Today we will hear two views of the book Fast Food Nation, The Dark Side of the All-American Meal by Eric Schlosser. Many have deemed this a fascinating socio-cultural report that explains how the development of fast food restaurants has led to the standardization of American culture, widespread obesity, urban sprawl and more. Well, I think that Schlosser's book promises a lot but delivers less than a highly hyped fast food meal. The book is not well written and it lacks organization as it skips around in its telling of fast food horror stories. And then he spends a great deal of time on Walt Disney and bashing Disneyland. Why is that in a book about fast food? Bashing is the best word for this book. According to this book, 
Schlosser clearly believes that the fast food industry is responsible for every problem in America today. From the common cold, to inflation, to malls, to unruly kids, to warts, he blames it all on big business and especially the big food business. The book is written in a breathless, alarming motive that makes it sound like McDonald's and Disney are co-conspirators to take over the world and force every living child to eat greasy french fries. Give me a break. Schlosser is also very biased for the left, praising unions while ripping right-wing values and Republicans. Nixon seems to get special attention. Just having your picture made with him gets sinister prose and makes you a co-conspirator. Despite claims of research, there are numerous blatant assertions such as Parents in the 80s spent more money on their children because they felt guilty about not spending time with them. How does he know that? Is all consumer spending on kids really driven by guilt? The book is a farce. Save your money to buy a Big Mac and read something else. Only read this ridiculous book if you are an anti-Republican, anti-big business, there are evil forces everywhere subverting the world fan. Thank you, William. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. Now we'll talk to another person with a very different assessment of this book. So, Jenny, what did you think of Schloss's book? Wow, where do I begin? I thought that this book was very informative, very well researched and a very easy read. Schlosser did a wonderful job of organising the vast amount of information that he placed in this book. For a non-fiction book, I found that Fast Food Nation kept me entertained throughout its entirety. In fact, I couldn't put it down. The history of the fast food industry itself was fascinating as well as the background information on the potato and meat industries. The first-hand accounts given by people who work for the fast food industry, as well as the meatpacking and potato plants, added to the reality of the points the book was trying to make. The fast food industry and all industries supported by fast food companies have some serious issues that need to be addressed by the nation. In addition, Schlosser does an excellent job of pointing out the dangers of not only working for these businesses, but eating foods supplied by them. It's scary to think about the dangers lurking behind the counter at your local fast food chain. This book really opens your eyes to some health hazards that all of America should be aware of. Everyone should read this book. It will change your eating habits and the way you view large fast food corporations. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today in our series of lectures on nature history, we're going to be looking at amber. Do you know amber? 
What is it? How is it formed? What are the uses of amber? Firstly, what is amber? Amber is fossilized resin from ancient forests. Amber is not produced from tree sap, but rather from plant resin. This aromatic resin can drip from trees, trapping debris such as seeds, leaves, feathers, and insects. The resin becomes buried and fossilized through progressive natural changes. Therefore, amber is formed as a result of the fossilization of resin that takes millions of years. Although a specific time interval has not been established for this process, the majority of amber is found approximately thirty to ninety million years ago. You may ask why resin is produced. Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, it is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury caused by insects and fungi. Resin may be produced to heal a wound, such as a broken branch, and resins have odors or tastes that both attract and repel insects. Resin may also be produced as a plant's method to dispose excess acetate. We know that amber survives millions of years, but what type of depositional environment preserved amber? One depositional environment for amber is marginal marine. Amber's specific gravity is slightly over one, and it floats in salt water. Therefore, amber becomes concentrated in marine deposits, moved some distance from the original site. Trees and resin may be transported and deposited in quiet water sediments. Wood and resin are buried under the sediment, and while the resin becomes amber, the wood becomes coal. Wet sediments of clay and sand preserve the resin well because they are devoid of oxygen. So, as a precious product of nature, what are the uses of amber? In ancient times, amber was used for medicine. Honey was mixed with powdered amber and prescribed for many chronics like asthma, gout, and the Black Plague. It was also used as precious decoration. The amber jewelry was thought to have the magic power against evil and dark forces. Sailors burned amber on ships to drive away sea monsters and the dangers of the deep. Amber has retained its beauty for millions of years, but if not preserved well, it may lose its charm. The softness and brittleness is likely to be attacked by chemicals and requires some special care in handling and storing. So do not put your amber jewelry on before hairspray and perfume is applied, because it will likely create a whitish coating on the amber that may be permanent. If you want to string the amber beads on silk or linen thread, remember to string them with knots between each bead to prevent mutual rubbing and chipping. Amber jewelry should not be stored where it can rub against metal or other jewelry, and storage in a soft cloth is best. Never put amber jewelry in a steam cleaner, which would shatter the gem. Never let amber come in contact with soaps or commercial jewelry cleaning solutions, which can dull the finish. Keep amber away from common kitchen substances such as salad oil, butter, and excessive heat of ovens and burners. Dust and sweat can be removed with clean, cool water and a soft cloth. Never use hot water. The amber can be dried and rubbed with clear olive oil, then rubbed with a soft cloth to remove excess oil and restore the polish. The last thing I'd like to mention is the storing of amber. Amber should not be placed near heating ducts or in direct sunshine, and avoid exposure to sudden changes of temperature. Well, that's all for amber today. Hope you enjoy this precious product of nature and have the luck to own one. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. End of the test.
You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.